First Peter chapter four. I'm going to sound political for a minute, and then you're going to realize I'm not in this. Um, but this is going to be a hard message. I'm going to give you a heads up. And uh, but you know what? People used to expect to hear a message, even if it was convicting, even if it was hard, because they wanted to hear truth and right and wrong instead of just be entertained and feel good about themselves and have a, a pastor that rubs their belly and, uh, and scratches their back and makes them feel good. And, uh, and so um, it'll be a, a little bit hard, and, uh, but uh, that's old-fashioned preaching. First uh, Peter chapter 4, I'm going to start at verse 12. And uh, I'll read uh, through verse 19. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. If ye reproach for the name of Christ, happy are ye. For the spirit and glory of, uh, the spirit and glory of God resteth upon you, on their part, he is evil spoken of, but on your part, he is glorified. And let none of you, uh, but let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other man's matters. Yet if any man suffers a Christian, let him, be, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. Uh, for, uh, and if it first begin at us, what shall be the end of them which obey not the gospel of God? And uh, if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God, commit the keeping of their souls uh, uh, to him in well-doing, in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. I want to talk today about MAGA. MAGA. Make America godly again. Make America godly again. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the chance to preach the word today. Uh, Lord, we, uh, this nation is in trouble with you. And uh, Lord, we, uh, we just come to you today. Uh, we need to uh, get this right. And it's not going to start anywhere but right in this room. And uh, Lord, I pray that you would help us today um, to uh, be drawn to you and to, uh, uh, to really see life clearly, Lord. We've Many people have been indoctrinated by the world. Their mind is not renewed. They've heard what the world has to say. They listen to the world's movies, entertainment, music. And so their mind is filled with worldliness. It, it doesn't compare to the amount they spend in their Bible and hearing preaching and fellowship with good Christians. So, Lord, they're not going to understand just the situation we're in many times. But I pray, Lord, that today you would give us the mind of Christ. I pray today you'd speak to our hearts. And I pray today that people who aren't saved would be saved. And people who are saved would uh, uh, let judgment begin with them and uh, really make us godly Christians and serve you. And we pray for your wisdom and your discernment. It's a special day, Lord. We pray that today it would be special most of all because of your presence and your power, that your Holy Spirit would uh, give wisdom and uh, the word to be preached clearly and correctly, and that uh, we would uh, get back to good old-fashioned Bible Christianity. We pray for your help today in Jesus' name. Amen. First of all, it says you can be seated. It says that uh, don't think it's strange concerning the trials which are going to uh, befall you. It says fiery trials. And, uh, and, and let me tell you, I've gone through trials that I didn't think were going to happen to me. I thought I've, I've, I, I headed that off. I thought that uh, that wasn't going to happen. But I'm going to tell you, Trials befall you. They just come upon you. They hit you. And even if you don't have a, uh, uh, even if you've done a lot of things right, even if you didn't think that ever happened to you, fiery trials fall on you. So it says, don't think it's strange. You live in a, an, an, a sin-cursed planet, and God doesn't promise that there's not going to be problems. He promises in heaven you'll get comfort. But there's, there's troubles in this world. And you and I are both going to go through troubles. But it actually says, don't just be shocked by them, but it says, uh, uh, rejoice in them. Some strange, as though some strange thing happened to you. The Bible says there's no temptation taking you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above your able, but will with the temptation make a way of escape, that ye may be able to bear it. He says, you know what? You're not the only one. Lots of people go through things. It hurts. It's hard when you go through it. It's a difficult time, but God knows. And God knows you can handle that, so he's not giving you more than you can handle. 
Uh, Chris, if we need any chairs, we have chairs in the kitchen. The, the folding chairs, we can put them on the back wall over there if we need them. Okay? Uh, only if we need them, though. No. Um, and so... We have, uh, we have these fiery trials which are going to fall on us. But don't think it's strange and, and understand that. Then it says, but rejoice, verse 13, inasmuch as you're partakers of Christ's sufferings. So Christ suffered, and, uh, and, and, and he knew what it was like. And, and really, it, gives, it goes in the context of suffering as a Christian. Suffering because you serve the Lord, because your enemies hate you, uh, because you love God, because your family mocks you or your friends mock you or something. And, uh, and, and, and we, we, we say, you know, we are going to rejoice in this thing because Christ suffered for us and he was mocked and, and, and laughed at and he was despised by men. And it might happen to me. I might have people who make fun of me, don't want to be around me anymore. I might be an outcast at work or in my own family. But he says rejoice because you are a partaker of Christ's suffering, and that suffering God will use to make you stronger. On his part, he's evil spoken of, but on your part, God is glorified. And, uh, and when the glory shall be revealed, when Jesus comes back, you get incredible rewards for your suffering for Christ. So rejoice in those things. It's okay to suffer as a Christian. Verse 14, if, it, if he be approached the name of Christ, happy are ye. And that's what the Bible says. The Bible says that you're so rewarded in Matthew 5 that if blessed are you when men persecute you. Blessed are you when men speak evil against you and revile you. For great is your reward in heaven. Rejoice. Because God says, hey, you're suffering for my name. I am so, I, it's such a big deal. You have such rewards in heaven. You have such rewards in heaven that you should be happy because I'm over rewarding you. I mean, can you imagine that happening on earth? Let's say your boss was the richest guy in the world, is Elon Musk. And he says, oh man, your finger got slammed the door and you got this black fingernail and it's hurting, you're in pain. And he says, you know what? Tomorrow, you're going to be glad that happened. I'm going to reward you so much for that. And he comes back and says, man, just trust me, you're going to be happy you got your finger smashed. But you just might start wondering. Is he talking a thousand, ten thousand, a hundred thousand, a million? And he comes back the next day and he over rewards you because the Bible says the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. We, God over rewards us for our suffering. And all of a sudden, Elon comes in the next day and, and he says, Yeah, I'm so sorry about your finger. Here's a million dollars. And you say, Hey, can I go get some more fingers smashed? Because the reward is so far above the suffering. He says, hey, rejoice. Because when the glory is revealed, you're going to get so rewarded in your suffering for my cause. Don't be afraid of suffering. Don't be afraid of persecution. If, if, somebody, if you try to witness to somebody, they don't take the track. They don't listen to you. You invite them to church. They make fun of you. Rejoice. You're going to get great rewards. You're suffering like Christ suffered for the salvation of souls and for to reach people and for the name of Christ. You're suffering. It says, when his glory is revealed, verse 13, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. If you reproach the name of Christ, happy are ye, for the, for the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. There comes a presence of God in your life when you're suffering for him that's great and different. On your part, he's evil spoken of. Uh, on, 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 I'm sorry, on their part, he's evil spoken of, but on your part, he is glorified. But, verse, verse uh, 15 is the, we're going to shift gears. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. Just, it just mentions a few things. Hey, don't suffer because you're doing the wrong thing. Not as a murderer. Not as an evildoer. Not as a, uh, uh, not as a, uh, 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 a thief. Don't, don't, don't go out and steal things and get caught and your boss fires you or the store arrests you and, and you say, oh man, God has, has, has made me suffer for his name. No, you're not suffering for the name of Christ. You're doing something evil. Right. And it says, don't suffer for doing wrong. If you get fired because you're lazy, don't, don't, don't blame that on God. Okay. Don't suffer as an evildoer. And then it mentions, or a busybody in other man's matters. That's so important. God says that's a big deal. He listen with murderers. You know, every once in a while, somebody started talking to me about something. I said, does this have to do with me? 
Because sometimes it does. Sometimes, hey, pastor, you know, so-and-so is really, really suffering and they're really sad right now because this happened to them. And, okay, I need to call them and check on them. Okay, that, that's, 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 that, that's not me being a busybody in other men's matters. That has to do with me. But, you know, don't you have enough deals of your own to stress you out and worry about? Why do you need to go in everybody else's business? If you need to know about it, they'll tell you. If they want you to pray for them, do that. But don't be a busybody in other men's matters. Uh, I'm so proud of this church that it's not a gossipy church because so many churches I hear are gossipy. And, uh, and, and, and thank God we, look, there, there's always something going on. But in, in other men's matters, you don't need to be involved in other people's stuff. Just, just mind your own business and do that well. And then those God puts in your life, you need to help. That's, that's your business because you're there to help them. Then be involved in that. Awesome. But not a busybody in other men's matters. That's not, that's not what we should be doing. Don't suffer for those things. And then he, he goes and he says in, in verse, um, um, let's go, uh, verse, 18, uh, verse 16, back to, yet if any man suffers a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. So we got to get our act right. Let's live, because if we live in the right kind of way as a Christian, and we live a truly godly Christian life, some people aren't going to like that. The Bible says, yea, all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Jesus said, if they hate me, they will hate you also. Not everybody hates God, but a few do. And those who don't like God are not going to like you if you're like Jesus. That's a compliment if you're like Jesus. And if they treat you like they treat Jesus. And so then it says, you know, so we've got to have a good name. Suffer as a Christian, that, that term in the Bible, as a little Christ is what the term means. And they, they, would, they would mock them and say, you're little Christ. And they would say, I like that, yeah. Try to do that, yeah, I like that. I claim that name. And if we suffer as a Christian, glorify God on that. And then he says, but we can't suffer as evildoers. That's bringing shame to the name of Christ. And then he says, we have got to start judgment in the house of God. Verse 17, for the time has come, the judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall be the end of them which obey not the gospel of God? He says, hey, don't suffer as an evildoer. Suffer as a Christian. You're going to suffer either way because you're in a sin-cursed world. Suffer because you did the right thing. Suffer because the devil is, is a fighting against you, not because God's fighting against you. Not because God's disciplining you for your sin, but because the devil hates what you're doing and he's fighting against you. But either way, you're going to be in a battle. And either way, you're going to have hard times. You might have hard times because God's presence isn't with you and he's not protecting you and he's not working all things together for good. You might be suffering because God's presence isn't protecting you and the devil's able to have his way and God's not filtering the bad things out of your life. But it says... It's time for us to clean up our act as God's people, and, and we have got to start with the judgment in the house of God, God's people. It is time that it begins with us. And I want to say it is time for that to happen in America. Everyone talks about the world, and everybody talks about how crazy the world is, and the world is crazy, amen? They're nuts. Common sense out the window. Uh, uh, they, they are so confused out there. It's unbelievable how confused the world is. And I want to say the world is wicked, but that's not what God's worried about. God said, I'm worried about my people, and judgment must begin at the house of God. The, the reason the world is so bad is because the church is so bad. We're the salt of the earth. We're the light on the hill. And there's darkness and they can't see anything because the church is not light. Just walked and talked the average un, uh, 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 unbeliever and you walk up and say, what do you think of the Christians in church you know? And see what they say. Thank God our church doesn't have the testimony. But I'm going to tell you, I get it a lot when they're out witnessing. Oh, I don't believe that stuff. I know a bunch of Christians, and they're doing this and that. They're worse than me. Or I went to church as a kid, and they gossiped about me a whole bunch. I went to church, and it was full of pettiness, and there was immorality in the church. And I, you know, I thought, this is nothing to this thing. Oh, man, that is not the testimony the church of God should have. Judgment must begin at the house of God. It starts with God's people. 
The church is not responsible. It's not responsible for <clears throat> um, for uh, 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 being ungod- ungodly, but uh, I'm sorry, let me say that again. The church is not responsible for being too godly. Amen. It is not reproached right now because it's too spiritual. They don't say, man, those Christians, they just really, I mean, I don't like the way they live. They really do pray, and they really love people, and I love some people I don't agree with, and, I, and you know what? They're feeding some people. I don't agree with that. They're not, they're, not, they're not criticizing for that. If you reproach the name of Christ, happy are ye, but don't suffer as an evildoer. The church is, is reproached right now for this, its distraction, for hypocrisy in the church, for immorality in the church, for not having light, for scandals, or doing nothing. That was a sad thing to me when, when, when one of our recent presidents, presidents talked about uh, Christians who were involved in politics. says, you know, these people, why don't they feed somebody or go help some needy people sometime? I don't agree with that president, maybe what he was saying, but it shouldn't even be able to be an accusation. Make America godly again. When America was founded, the rest of the world was like, what in the world? How is this? How did this little tiny nation, this little tiny 13 colonies, just destroy the most powerful empire in the world, the British Empire? And how are they having uh, such incredible uh, fruit? And why uh, are they producing such geniuses and inventing so many things and prospering and, and expanding? Why is this nation so incredible? And the rest of the world is like, what? There's never been a nation that's rose like this and with the greatness. And wow. And they've sent a, 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 a French, uh, a brilliant French philosopher, politician, a historian. He's a very smart man, and 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 uh, and and he came here to America, and he went and he studied. Uh, he studied America, and he went. He went to all the political meetings. He went to the. He went to the to the to the uh, uh, the uh, the businesses. He went uh, all the way um, up and down the coast, and he studied America, and he went to all kinds of situations. He went to the frontier, and he came back. And he wrote, he wrote out what he found about America. He said, I searched all of America. And I have a quote somewhere. He said, I searched all of America. And he said, I went to the political houses and the capitals. He said, I went to the, to the, to the, uh, 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 to the bars. And I went to, the, uh, to the, uh, uh, the public houses. I went to all these different places. I went uh, to the gathering places. And I went to churches. And he says, I came back and I found out why America is great. He said, America is great because America is good. He says, I found the greatness of America in its churches. The churches thunder out righteousness, and America is a good people and a moral people. And because they're a moral people, they have this freedom that people can choose things, and the government doesn't have to control their life because they'll make the right choices because they're a good people. And that the pulpits are the key to America. And he said, America is great because America is good. If America ever ceases to be good, America will cease to be great. And he took that back to his government and wrote about it. Well, America is no longer good. There's a lot of bad here. There's some good, but there's a lot of bad. But it didn't happen because of the unsaved. It happened because of the church. The church became known for scandal, hypocrisy, Sunday-only Christians, Live in one way at home, live in a different way at church. And that is not what God wants. And God says we need to straighten this thing out. Make America godly again. But it starts with God's people. The heathen are not the problem. Look what it says here in, in chapter 4. Verse 17, for the time has come, the judgment must begin at the house of God. Whoa, that's where judgment begins. That's where it begins. Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14 says, talks about if, if your nation Israel is ungodly, and if I've judged this nation, and land is suffering, and punishment is upon the nation, and you guys are taking captives, and being destroyed by your enemies, and falling apart as a nation... He tells them what to do. He doesn't say, if those heathen nations are taking you over, knock them out. He doesn't say, uh, 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 kick out the ungodly people. He says this. He says, if my people, 2 Chronicles seven fourteen, if my people, which are called by my name, 
shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven, forgive their sin and heal their land. He says nothing about the heathen. He says nothing about the unsaved. He says nothing about the ungodly. Um, he says none of those things. He says, you know, it's about my people. They are, they are going under. They are being punished. They are being judged because of their sin. And they need to repent. There are a bunch of revivals in the Bible. There's a, a revival in Judah under Josiah. You know what that revival started with? That brought the Bible back to Josiah and read it to him. And he broke down and started weeping and fasting and saying, we are in the judgment of God. We have neglected God's law. And we've got to get the priests. And we've got to get together. And we've got to worship God in truth. And it started with Josiah the king repenting. Amen. And then the priests. And then the people repenting. There's another one under Hezekiah, and Hezekiah revival came and they got back to the Bible, and he saw the, the, the wickedness of his nation, and Hezekiah repented, and the, the leaders, the princes, and the priests, and the Levites, the heads, the spiritual people, the spiritual leaders of the nation began to repent. There was another revival under Ezra, and the nation was na wicked. It wasn't doing right, and they were, they were all mingled with the world and ungodly, as the Bible tells us we're not supposed to do. We're supposed to be unspotted from the world, and they were intermingled with the world, and, and, and they couldn't get anything done for God, and the nation was ungodly. And Ezra fell down on his face and prayed, and he confessed his sins. And the sins of his nation. And then when he to open his eyes, there was the princes and the priests and the Levites and the leaders and the people surrounding him and weeping out to God and confessing their sins. They weren't worried about Babylon and the king of Babylon. They weren't worried about the king of Persia. They weren't worried about the Assyrians and how they were all over and how ungodly they were. It was started with God's people. Because the unsaved aren't God's children. They aren't accountable to God. He's not their father. I've got to start with my children and raise my kids right. Okay? I can't raise everybody else's kids. They're not my kids. I can't discipline them. But I can work on my house. Amen. And God says that my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves. He emphasizes this. It's about my people. Another revival is Pentecost. Yeah. This wicked city had just crucified Jesus. Yep. And... The revival happened when God's people prayed for 50 days. Not, let's go out and find the, the, the high priest who condemned Jesus. Let's find Pilate. How wicked is he? How, who are those Sanhedrin who asked Jesus, who, 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 said, who, who said, send Jesus to the cross? Who is the crowd? Let's find look at those wicked people. They said, give us a thief and a robber. Give us Barabbas, not Jesus. Where are those people? They need to turn their lives around. That's not what they did. They stayed in church, and they prayed for 50 days. Amen. And revival broke out. Why? Because judgment must start at the house of God. You'll read about revivals, and the conviction comes out of the house of God into society, and the, even the unsaved and ungodly start feeling convicted for what they're doing, even though they don't know why. Because the presence of God is brought into God's people. And then when God's presence is there, conviction begins to come. But God's abandoned a lot of the churches. He's taken away their candlestick, as it says in Revelation 2. And he says, you're no longer a church. And I'm not going to walk in the midst of the church. And so there's no power there. The people in the church are just as immoral as the world. And judgment must begin at the house of God. We've got all kinds of distractions. We've got preachers after money. We've got uh, uh, immorality in churches, sleeping around and, and, and immorality inside the church. We've got uh, gossip and laziness and not fulfilling the Great Commission. People come to church to go try to make connections for business. Judgment must begin at the house of God. That's where it must begin. Why do you think we don't let stuff like that? Why do you think we deal with stuff? Why, if someone comes in or start, they come in here to, to start their multi-level marketing. We say, no, 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 no. That's not what we're about here. This is God's house. Amen. We're serious here. If you want a not serious church, you want to play games with God, you're at the wrong place. 
It starts with God's house. We've got to get revival in our lives. And it goes down even lower. It goes to you. It goes to me. It's not so much about criticizing what the world's doing. It's judging ourselves and staring at ourselves and saying, I don't expect the world to be godly if we Christians aren't shining light. We are the light of the world, Matthew 5 tells us. If there's no light in the world, why are we surprised people are in darkness or stumbling around? That's what's going to happen. There's no conscience. There's no Holy Spirit conviction. There's no word of God being preached. Nobody even knows what the Bible says when Christians are boldly proclaiming the word of God and witnessing. Judgment was to begin at the house of God. It starts with us. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves. And we live in what I call the Laodicean day. Let me take it to Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3. We live in a Laodicean day, which is lukewarm. Not even realizing their condition. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 15 says this, I know thy works, that thou art neither hot nor cold. I would thou art hot or cold. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither hot or cold, I will spew thee out of my mouth, because thou sayest, I am rich, and increase with much goods, and have need of nothing. And knowest thou not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked? I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich and, and, uh, and white raiment thou mayest be clothed and uh, anoint thine eyes thy thyself that thou mayest see and the nakedness thy nakedness would appear. He says, look, you don't even know what a mess you are. You don't even know what a mess you are. And that's the day we live in. A lot of churches don't even know they're not even godly. And they need to see clearly. We live in that lukewarm. They're not the horrible. They're, they're okay. They're, they love God. They love the world. They're kind of in between. They make some hot water of God, some cold water of the world. And, and God says, it's disgusting. I'm spewing you out of my mouth. I'm vomiting you up. I, I, I don't accept you. God has demands of his people. And I, I don't want anybody in the world ever having to tell me, you guys should... should, should fix your act. I don't need them to do that. I've got God in the Bible to do that. If it gets to that level where an ungodly person goes up and says, you know, you guys are really bad. Something's really wrong. Something's really wrong. I thank God again this week. Somebody uh, talked to me from out of state about our testimony in this area. That, of course, we're Christians. Why wouldn't the world be impressed that we live godly? Why wouldn't we have a good name? Why wouldn't we pay our bills and talk honestly and live the same way on Thursday as we do on, on Sunday? Why wouldn't we take a Christianity to our homes? Why wouldn't we have a godly place where people aren't gossiped about but are loved and lifted? Why wouldn't we have that? That's the least we could do as Christians. It's what we're supposed to do. Judgment must begin at the house of God. God is disgusted with a church. That's what he says. I'll spew it out of my mouth. When you have no judgment, no holiness, no godliness. You say, yeah, those churches are bad. Quit criticizing churches when you are not living a godly, holy life. Can't believe any ungodly Christians talk about how bad churches are. How many Christians have said, I'm really glad you're doing that, Pastor. Why don't you do it? Oh, you know, it's not for me. You're a Christian too. You have the same God as I do. And you need to live it. And, and the very thing somebody criticized the church about, they gossip about a church that's gossipy. They're living with their girlfriend and talking about how the church is full of hypocrites. If you would look at yourself, and if a lot of people would look at themselves, as harshly as they look at churches, as harshly as they look at the guy on TV, who's, who's a charlatan after money, 
And you're also not going to church because you're working on Sunday because your job. Because there's no judgment in the house of God. It's all outward judgment. I'm going to read you a verse that says it's very powerful. But judgment must begin at the house of God. Now, in St. Lucia, uh, in the Caribbean, when you get saved, you are expected to live like a Christian. They talk about it in the community. Oh, old whatever his name is there. He got saved, man. He's going to turn his life around. Now he's going to be all different. And if you don't, the unsaved come to you. You thought you became a Christian. There's a church. So, so Brother Filbert, he was, he was, he was preaching in a church <clears throat> in, uh, in North Carolina. And, uh, and he was preaching in the church. And, and when he got done preaching, he was expecting, you know, pretty, pretty good sized church. And it was a, a church that, that, uh, that, 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 you know, invited him as a missionary to come preach there. And he preached that it went really well. And he got done the service and he was, he was, he was, he was, he got, they all dismissed and prayed. And he kind of looked around and nobody was around. And he's like, kind of wanting to fellowship and see if God was speaking to people. And he couldn't find everybody. He walked outside, he found everybody outside smoking. It was the Winston-Salem area. Well, the, the group from that church came to his church, and they worked on his building. And one of the guys that was working on his building walked off into the, uh, away from the site and started smoking. And one of the neighbors said, are you from that church over there? What are you doing? I thought you guys were from a church. You, you don't smoke if you're a Christian. That's wicked. That's ungodly. And you're hiding out here. We should go back. Let's go back and tell the people you're with. Just let them have it. They weren't even a church person. Because Christians are expected, expected to have certain things and to live a certain way. And I'll to make sure we get everybody seated get in, in chairs and stuff. And so <clears throat> that's what we do. Judgment must begin at the house of God. Well, I don't like that. I don't want to be telling me anything. Well, I got you here now. I'm going to hold and unload the boat. Because you need to realize there's an expectation if you want to name them, name them, name them of Christ. It's important. If you want to claim to be a Christian, God gets disgusted. Romans chapter 2. Romans 2 is going to be rough on you. Those who criticize churches should make sure they've judged themselves first. Judge themselves first. And make sure they're right. As harsh as you are on other people, the first person that should judgment should begin with is you. The first people that we should make sure are right is open door. I have told you before, I can't do anything else about other churches. I can do something about this church. And make sure we are loving people. We're being a light. We're sharing the word. We're witnessing. We're giving. We're helping. We're praying. We can make sure we're doing right. You can get so distracted looking at other people. But start with yourself. Look at your church, and then we can start going outward and helping people instead of just criticizing. Romans chapter 2. Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou the judgest, whosoever thou judgest, for wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. For thou the judgest doeth the same things. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against such, against them which commit such things. And it's going to get rough here. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judges them which do such things and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? Whoa. Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and, and forbearance and longsuffering, not knowing the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? But after thy hardness and impenitence at heart, treasures up to thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. He says, you know, you're judging the people, but you're doing the same things. And, you know, when you got that one finger pointing at somebody else, you got three pointing back at yourself. And, and you're doing the same things. And it says, you are despising the righteousness and, and the kindness and, the, and the, the long-suffering of God. You don't even know that the good you did, God led you in. God spoke to your heart. God drew you. And it's God's goodness that made you repentant. 
and God's power that spoke to your heart. And only by the goodness of God, you are what you are. How can you be so, so looked down at others like, oh, those petty people that are so wicked. I can't believe them. Clutching your pearls. Ah. And you forget who you are. And you're judging people, who, and you do the same things. We've got to start with ourselves. How can you say, I can't believe they would do that? When you're doing things that, but your, your sin is okay. Your sin is not big stuff. Their sin's dirty. My sin's kind of clean. I mean, I have some pride, but they're liars. The Bible says God hates pride. It's an abomination. You have a lust problem, and they're a thief. They're lazy, and you got an anger problem. Look at yourself. Stay humble. You don't, you, don't, you don't look down on people when you remember who you are and where you'd be without God. It makes you love people. It makes you say, hey, they have some struggles. You know what? I do too. Let's, let's, let me go pray with them. Let me go see if I can help them. Instead of, what's wrong with you? You're, you're thinking, yeah. You know, it, it starts with us. And you're going to learn in life, you can't control anybody else. There's one person you can control, and that's you. You can't even control your toddler. You can't control your cat. So, so get yourself right, and then you'll be able to influence others. It's a powerful, powerful thing to understand that. So what do we do? What do we do in this situation? Number one, you need to be saved. Amen. First Peter chapter 4, back to our text there originally. We doing okay? Say, yeah. so, Pastor, you're being rough today. I'll blame it on an old-fashioned day. Yeah. It's a wonderful thing in a person who doesn't struggle with loneliness. 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 18. I feel, I feel like I got a crowd up here with me. Because I got God. I got, I, got, I got four of us up here. Father, Son, the Holy Spirit, and me. God plus one equals a majority. 1 Peter 4 18 says this, And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the uh, ungodly and the sinner appear? You know that you in salvation, we're so sinful, me in salvation, we, I mean, God comes in and washes away our sin, and it's an amazing thing, but you know, we were lost and dead in trespasses and sin, and God had to draw us in and die for our sins and send the Holy Spirit to convict us and send us a soul winner. It's a work, and it barely happens. And it says, look, if the, if, the, if the saved people are barely saved, if they're barely saved, what kind of trouble are the unsaved in? I want to say, without Christ, you are under the judgment of God. The wages of sin is death. You're dead in your trespasses and sin. Sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. But as by one man sin entered the world, and death by sin. The Bible says, if you don't have the Son, you're dead already. Your soul is dead, spiritually dead. You're under the judgment of God. You are bound for hell without Christ. And I wouldn't love you if I didn't tell you that. And it says you've got to be saved. Except a man be born again, he shall not see the kingdom of God. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. He's condemned already because he has not believed on the name of the only begotten Son of God. Your sins have separated you from God. You have no hope of heaven unless Jesus removes those sins. You cannot remove those sins. And God has judged you already for your sins. It says guilty. And until you receive Jesus, those sins are taken away, which he took your guilt. You will never go to heaven. So you need to be saved. Today is your day. I wouldn't leave this building. I wouldn't get in my car. I wouldn't, certainly wouldn't drive down the road if I wasn't saved. My sins were forgiven and heaven wasn't my home because heaven is forever and hell is forever. And the way to start this process of getting fixed and, and the way to get MAGA, which is make America godly again, is everybody getting saved. 
It starts with everybody in this room, and we love you, and I had to get saved and come to Christ and realize I was a sinner and accepted my Savior, and everybody in this room had to do it. And today's your day, I hope, if you've never received Christ, because that's where it starts. Number two, what do we do? We judge ourselves. 1 Peter 4.15, it says, um, um, uh, verse 16, it says, Yet if any of you suffers a Christian, then not be ashamed, but will glorify God on his behalf. Verse 17, For the time has come, the judgment must begin at the house of God. Verse 15, Let none of you suffer as an evildoer. We read Romans 2. It says, God's going to judge you if you're judging other people, and you're doing the same things. You cannot escape the judgment of God. I want to take you to a verse in 1 Corinthians 11. I almost made it a memory verse this week. This is talking about in church, these people during the Lord's Supper, during uh, 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 the communion time, they're getting drunk. They're being horrible. The church is full of all kinds of sin. And he says, some of you have died already from this because God is judging you for your wickedness in God's house. And he says, you know what? You don't have to be judged. You don't have to have God punish you and make some of you sick. Verse 30, it says, this is 1 Corinthians uh, uh, 11. It says, verse 30, for this cause many are weak and sickly among you and many sleep. That means that some have died. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. Do you know what confessing your sin is? It's getting to it before God does. <laughs> it's getting to it before God does. Lord, I messed up. I'm so sorry. Forgive me. It's confessing. And that avoids the judgment of God. If you're born again, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse them all in righteousness. There ought to be times when you say, you know what? You're being a knucklehead. And you judge yourself and say, you're going to, you know what? We're going to fast until you overcome this. You're not eating. You're gonna, we're, we're not going to do this anymore. Hey, this gossip thing's going to be overcome. You're going to go and you're going to tell your friends, if I start gossiping, you tell me to knock it off. I'm putting that accountability program on my, on my phone, and if I start looking at something bad, it's going to send bells and alarms to somebody. Yeah. I'm going to judge myself, so I don't need to get judged. I'm going to go, and I'm going to tell my, my, the person who I owe money to, I'm a Christian, I'm going to pay you, and if I don't pay you, you remind me I'm a Christian. If you need to, call my pastor. Judge ourselves. If... if you know, if a kid just says, you know, I, I'm not going to do this. I'm going to do right. They don't need to get spanked. <laughs> I never choose to spank my kids. My ch kids choose to get spanked. <laughs> I don't just say, hey, I feel like whacking my kid. Where's the switch? I don't do that. We have rules, and I say, I'm very sorry you chose to get spanked today. You broke rule number four. And, and so that is a big deal there, that we understand that we should judge ourselves. And if you would go, and here's what happens. When you start saying, you know, I'm not the greatest thing, am I? You know what? I need to do better than this. You start getting humble, and you quit being so critical and nasty to people, and you start becoming holy because you're being honest about yourself. Because, listen, a lot of people, what they do is look at the people and say, I'm not as bad as them, not as bad as them. I must be good. That guy's five foot. That, that, that guy's four foot eleven. I'm the biggest guy in the court. I'm LeBron James. That's what you start doing. No, you're still five foot six. Just because you're big, better than them doesn't mean anything. The Bible says uh, we are not of those who can compare themselves among themselves. And just look at yourself and say, hey, I need to work on some things. That humbles you. And when you're humble, you treat people differently. And it also gets a blessing of God on you. Oh, how many times in a family have I seen that one person says, my spouse is so messed up or my parents are so bad. I, and I always say the same thing. You can't change that. But what you need to do is work on you. Because if you will get God's presence on you, it starts affecting them. You bring the Holy Spirit into the house. You bring God's presence in the house and the Holy Spirit starts working on them. But you can't. You need to get right with God. You're, you're bitter at them, and you're mad at them, and you're bitter at them, and you don't have God's presence because you're so focused on them. You're bitter at them. You can't change anybody. It must start at us. 
I, I can't expect you to be godly. I've seen pastors get bitter at the people because because no one wanted to help and no one wanted to work and no one seemed to be trying and and they get bitter at them and they lower themselves into that sin and now they don't have God's blessing and they can't affect those people. I got to stay right no matter what you do because I can't control you. I can control me sometimes. (laughs) Work on yourself. Judge yourself. Number three, pick a side. Luke eleven twenty three. 23, he that gathereth not with me is against me. He that, uh, he, that, he that is not with me is against me. He that gathereth not with me scattereth. I'm going to take it back to the Old Testament, 1 Kings chapter 18. The Bible has imperatives about picking a side. <clears throat> we see that. Let you suffer as a Christian, not as an evildoer. You got to be clearly on God's side. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. It's a side you pick. My fr- be not, uh, it says, it says, uh, it says you're, you're friends of the world. Don't know you not that friendship with the world is enmity with God. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Uh, for James 4.4. 4. Um, and, and so you, you find out you got to pick a side. If you're, if you're right now, you couldn't stand in the, right on the border of Russia and Ukraine and say, I'm a Rukanian. Uh, it's not going to work. You get shot by both sides. <laughs> it doesn't work. And you can't have this world and be on Jesus' side. Israel tried this, and finally the prophet got tired of it. And he called him, and he said, Look, if God's God, serve him. If not, serve Baal. But how long halts you between two opinions? Got to start and get this thing right. And, uh, and in 1 Kings, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, I'm getting the Kings here, 1 Kings chapter 18. He says this in verse um, 20. He says, so Ahab sent on the children of Israel, God's people. He wasn't worried about the, the wicked nations surrounding them. And gathered the prophets together in Mount Carmel. And Elijah came unto all the people and said to them, How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him not a word. They hadn't decided yet. He goes and he calls the prophets of Baal and they have a sacrifice. And he says, let the God that answers by fire, let the God that answers by fire be the true God and you serve him. And the prophets of Baal tried to call down fire and nothing happened. Elijah came up there. He watered everything and poured water on the sacrifice and filled the trenches with water. And he called down fire from heaven and consumed everything, including the rocks. And by the way, God has fire. Churches ought to have fire. Preachers ought to have fire. Christians ought to have fire. And the fire came down, and they answered, and they chose a side. In verse 39, it says, And and when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and said, The Lord, he is the God. The Lord, he is the God. Pick a side. You're going to live with something for the next trillion years. You better pick the right side. But we have a good God who is worthy of us picking his side. He loves us. He died for us. He's a friend to us. He comforts us. He's there for us. He never leaves us. He gives us life and breath and everything else. And we ought to love him and pick him. He's a good God. And he rewards you for all of eternity. He'll reward you. But you got to pick a side. The judgment starts with God's people. With you. With me, with us choosing to go and be saved, for us choosing to judge ourselves and say, I've got to get right. I've got to quit worrying about how wicked people are in Washington, D.C., and how wicked people are in Olympia, and how wicked people are in Seattle, and look what they're doing in, in this state. And look, You know, I need to fix myself. You know, those people don't know any better. I know better. I need to live more godly. My prayer life has not been what it should be. I need to pray more. I've not loved, you know, I'm kind of bitter against somebody. You know, I'm, I'm criticizing the, those people over there are doing this. I'm not saying we shouldn't stand for right and shouldn't say this, but I think that we ought to be right first. And judgment begins at God's house, and we become what God wants us to be individually and then as a church, and then as the church in general, as Christians in general. 
because we can't control them. But if we can be an example and a light as a church, maybe some of the churches can get back to biblical Christianity. Because they believe right still, but it's kind of lukewarm in America, the churches are. So let us start with you. And then we need to pick a side. I'm all in on God's side. I, I am, I'm not doing the, the, the Rukanian thing. I'm not doing that. I'm on God's side. I'm, I'm, I'm going to serve him, and I am going to boldly proclaim him. And then we might suffer, but as a, as a person, as a Christian, not as an evildoer, we got to be on the right side. Serve the Lord. If you're not saved, be saved. If you're saved, make sure you're checking yourself out more than you're checking other people out. And then, uh, and then go out and, uh, and pick a side, and this will make a difference in the world. But it begins with us begins with us. I'm going to read that verse in 1 Peter, and I'll, and I'll pray and finish. Back to that original passage there, and I'll just go to the, through to the end of the chapter. 1 Peter 4, verse uh, 16, Yet if any of you suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. For the time has come, the judgment must begin at the house of God, and the, if, the, uh, if the first begin with us, what shall be the end of them which obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Wherefore then, uh, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as in a faithful creator. We trust God with our souls and our lives, and we're in a very wonderful, secure place. Choose you this day whom you will serve. Time to get serious. The heat is on, and we're in an ungodly world, and Jesus is getting ready to come. We need to pick a side and get serious and stand out as great lights in a dark world.